Can you see me now? <laughs> Still. Still. Oh. Okay. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to be back. Uh, as you may know, uh, we did have a, a wonderful trip um, uh, a couple weeks ago to see our great grandson, Grayson. Alan Starr down in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. We had a wonderful trip. It was uh, it was um, it was good. Uh, we got to see the baby. Uh, he is a real cutie, if I do say so. Takes after his great grandfather, and <laughs> it was obvious because he eats all the time. I never seen I never seen a kid eat so much. Or maybe I've just forgotten how they are, but it's just like he is. And we just looked at pictures recently since we've been back, and he's just grown even more, and it's just amazing. I think they're feeding him miracle Grow, some kind of formula. <laughs> but it's it's really it was a good trip, and we're glad to be. But we're glad to be back, and good to be here today on this beautiful Sabbath day. <clears throat> you know, when when Moses got up that morning. and counted the sheep, he did not say to himself, I think I'll take the sheep on the west side of the wilderness over by the mountain of God. Now, Mount Horeb was simply Mount Horeb, an, an indistinct rock, really, in the wilderness, like so many other hills and mountains, completely ordinary looking. There was nothing special about it. Ordinary mountain. But Mount Horeb became Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, simply because God chose it, not because it was taller, mightier, or holier than any of their surrounding hills and mountains. In a similar way, Moses became Moses, the man of God, because God called him, encountered him, and commissioned him, not because he was more pious, mightier, smarter, or more eloquent than other men, in fact, he was, when God called him, he was a murderer on the run. He had a speech impediment of some sort. God is in the ordinary, and encounters with God happen in ordinary places. When God is encountered, the ordinary is immediately transformed into the extraordinary. The very ordinary Mount Horeb was transformed into the extraordinary Mount Sinai because God's presence was there. The very ordinary Moses, the simple Hebrew exile from Egypt, a shepherd in the wilderness, was transformed into Moses, the man of God, the greatest prophet of all times except for Jesus the Christ, because he encountered God, and God transformed the, ex the ordinary man into something extraordinary. Most of us, I think, do not regard ourselves as extraordinary people. You probably think of yourself as a fairly ordinary person with a fairly mundane life. From God's perspective, though, brethren, that is perfect. You are the perfect person with whom he can do extraordinary things. He is not looking for prophets. He's looking for normal people who are carrying on under normal circumstances. For some reason, God likes choosing ordinary people to do his work. Remember Gideon? He was a farmer threshing wheat in a wine press to hide from the Midianites. But God chose him to deliver Israel. How about David? A boy shepherd. The youngest of the family. The smallest. He was no warrior like his brothers. He was a shepherd. But God chose him to be a king over Israel. Not just king, but the greatest king of Israel. 
on whose dynasty God said he would establish his throne forever and fulfill in his, the giving of the Messiah. Or how about Ruth, an, un, an unknown widow from Moab? God chose her to be the great-great-grandmother of his own son, the Messiah. Or Amos. Amos is a good example. He was a sheep herder and a sycamore fig farmer, a literal fig picker. <laughs> but God used him to be a prophet of repentance to the northern tribes of Israel. Or what about Israel herself? as a nation. Turn with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, we'll start with verse 6. God speaking to this nation. He says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the peoples who were on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than the other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of the people. You were insignificant. You weren't a big, giant empire like Egypt or Assyria. Or what about Yeshua? What about Jesus himself? His very own disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. They were fishermen. Fishermen from a, from a far-flung province of Galilee. They weren't educated. Like the esteemed rabbis of Jerusalem. They were a bunch of hick fishermen in the eyes of the Judeans. But God chose them to lay the foundation for His church. And let me ask you, what do you remember about what God did through Elisha? Here's just a few things. He raises the widow's son back to life. He made an iron axe head float. He healed Naaman of leprosy. He made the widow's oil keep flowing. How did he start out? Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. We'll start with verse 19. So, now this is speaking of Elijah here, but beginning with. So he, Elijah, departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shepheth, who was plowing with twelve yoke, yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was the twelfth. So he was the son of a, of a farmer out plowing in his father's field. And it goes this on to say, Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and then sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the, with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. You see, Elijah calls this son of a farmer to follow him, to one day be his successor. This Elisha was an ordinary person. The Bible gives no qualifications why God should choose him. It doesn't say he was a talented speaker. It doesn't say he was a scholar. It doesn't say he was a man of great influence. 
It doesn't say he was any kind of a great leader. In fact, he was on the end of the line, plowing with the twelfth team of oxen. So even the hired hands of his father were in front of him as he was plowing. And he was eating the dust of the, 11, the other eleven. In fact, brethren, Elisha was just an ordinary guy. But God chose him to be the man who would do extraordinary things for God. God likes to choose ordinary people to do his work. People just like you and me. He wants to use them in his church, in his ministries, in your home, in your workplace, everywhere. Consider the example of a very expensive work of art, a painting, like, for example, the Mona Lisa. What makes it so expensive, in fact, priceless? Is it a special type of canvas that the artist paints on? Perhaps the special paint, a unique type of brush? No. It's the talents and skills of the artist who gave that painting its value. Turn with me, if you will, now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of mo noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that, human, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, God wants to make sure that we know that it is he who is extraordinary. It is he who transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary. Just as the artist uses ordinary paints, ordinary brushes, and ordinary canvases, so God uses ordinary people like you and me to accomplish extraordinary things for him. Thinking back again to the 12 disciples, they were just ordinary run-of-the-mill fishermen. Rubes from Galilee. But look at what God was able to do through them. So is it possible for ordinary people like you and me to do extraordinary things for God? Can you and I live lives like Daniel, Joseph, Moses, Abraham, or Elisha? And if we can, how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, number one, we need to know God. We need to know God. I don't mean we need to know about God. I mean we need to know God. Knowing all the typical Sabbath school Bible stories does not constitute knowing God. If I were to go to the library or the internet, I could learn a lot of things about Abraham Lincoln. I could learn his birthday, what his pet dog's name was, what he liked to eat, what he liked to do for fun. I could learn all that stuff about him, but I still wouldn't be able to tell you that I know Abraham Lincoln. Why? Because I've never met the man. I've never talked to him. I've never had any kind of personal interaction with him at all. And sadly, that describes many Christians' relationship with God. 
Sure, they know the stories about God. They know that He is powerful and loving and all that stuff. But they've never met Him. They've never had a personal meeting with the living God. The question is today then, do you know God? Have you met Him? Do you meet Him every day in, your, in the Scriptures? In your Bible? In your prayer time? In your fellowship with others? Do you know God? Well, there's a test you can do to find out if you really do know Him. And you can find it in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, it says, And by this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So there it is, brethren. You can tell that you really know God if you obey him. We need to be a willing to obey. You know, God sometimes asks people to do some pretty strange things. He asked Joshua to mount, march around Jericho seven times. He asked Abraham to kill his own son, his only begotten heir, Isaac. He asked Ezekiel to lay on his side for 390 days straight as an illustration of his prophecy. But you know what? Every one of those people were willing to obey God. So my question is, what is God asking you to do? Are you willing to obey? Maybe He's asking you to change your priorities. Maybe He's asking you to talk to your coworker about something related to your faith. Maybe He's asking you to take on a greater role in the church. Or maybe He's asking you to lay on your side for 390 days. I don't know what God's asking you to do in your life. And really it doesn't matter. What matters is, are you willing to obey Him? Are you willing to make that hard decision to do what you, you know God wants you to do? Whether it's working on some, some chronic habit that you've been trying to overcome or some, some part of your life that's perhaps keeping you back from your full potential? Whatever it is, are you willing to obey God? In order for us to do anything for God, we need to be willing to obey. We also need to be alive. <laughs> now, let me explain what I mean by that. This is going to require a science test. Angie, you're, you're excluded from them. Which of the following things are alive? A rock? A fish? A pop can? A tree? A telephone? A key? A spider? Well, we can tell what things are alive and what things are not alive by three things. Living things grow change, and reproduce themselves. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. It says, But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
So it says here, brethren, that we are made alive. That means alive spiritually. And that means we need to grow, we need to change, and we need to reproduce ourselves. Here's just the, some of the things we can do to grow as Christians. Number one, read the Bible. Study the scriptures. Learn what God's trying to tell us. And that includes meditation, meditating on them. Not just reading it like we might read a novel, but reading it to, so we can see what we need to do. And then meditating on those things, considering how it applies to our lives, what we need to do to change, to come into conform, conformity with God's, with God's law. We need to pray. Paul says, pray without ceasing. That means we pray, not that we never stop, but that we pray and we pray and we pray. We pray throughout the day. We pray. Morning, noon, and night. And that includes occasional fasting, brethren. Sometimes we need to focus. And that includes, so fasting is a great way to do that. We need to fellowship with one another. Iron sharpening iron. Strengthening the brethren and letting the brethren strengthen us sometimes. Especially now in these times, brethren, when there's so much uncertainty in the world and we are facing times like unprecedented, at least for us. When we don't know what's going to happen next, we need to be together more than ever. Bound in the unity of the Spirit. Propping each other up, brethren. Strengthening ourselves for the times to come. We also need to make disciples, whether by example or personal testimony. I love the old saying, you may be the only, you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. So how have we been doing with that list? Have we been growing? Because as we grow, we'll change. That's the telltale sign of a growing Christian. They change. If it, you're exactly like you were two years ago, maybe you need to review that list. If you haven't been changing, then you haven't been growing either. But as you grow you, and as you change, there's something that will naturally follow that you will begin to reproduce yourself. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, a verse we're very familiar with. It says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, reproduce yourselves. Reproduce disciples of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. How well have we been doing on that? How well have we been making disciples? Are we alive? Are we growing? Are we changing? Are we reproducing ourselves? Because those are the keys, brethren. If we know God, if we are willing to obey, if we are alive, that's how you and I Ordinary people can do extraordinary things for God. You know, when Moses saw that burning bush, he turned aside to investigate. 
Only then did the Holy One reveal Himself to Moses. And sometimes I think our problem is that we do not take the time to turn aside and investigate. Oh, it's our intention. Oh, it's, it's in our intention to grow spiritually. We all imagine that one day we will take time to study, to grow in the Scripture, to work on that, that one particular habit or whatever that we need to get out of our life, to pray regularly. But you know what, brethren? You can't take good intentions to the grave. A famous rabbi once said, Do not say to yourself, When I have more time, I will study Scripture. Perhaps you will not have more time. Do not say, When I have more time, I will turn aside. Because we don't know how much time we have left. As I look out over this little congregation, you know what I see? I see ordinary people. Ordinary people chosen by an extraordinary God. But here's the thing, brethren. If we do our part in growing spiritually, God will make the ordinary extraordinary. Brethren, expect great things.